if you can go back in time and do something different. Almost every investor I talked to was like, I wish I house hacked right away. Minimize your expenses, mm -hmm. maximize your cash flow and net worth. And that's what I tell you to do. Welcome to the Never Employed Chat. My name is Sam and I interview people who make a living beyond salary jobs. Entrepreneurs, business owners and investors. So that we can learn from their stories together. There are many great ways to make a living. And even more ways to wealth. At Never Employed, we encourage you to think of alternatives to employment jobs. What would you do if a salary job was simply no option? When I meet real estate investors, I always wonder how it feels to be quite heavily in debt, which is something which, <laughs> which I associate with being a real estate investor. Sure. Um, so being heavily in debt, I think, is not too much of a weight on our at least my mind, and I'm pretty sure Drew's as well, because there's a difference between that good debt and that bad debt. And so things like credit cards and expensive liabilities are things that that debt is not being serviced in any way that's useful when it comes to financial aspect. It's providing some type of personal value, which is important. We all need things that we enjoy and we love. But when, when you're on the path to wealth building, that was typically can be a detriment to your growth. And so the debt that we're putting ourselves in, whether it's from small uh, rentals to multifamily to I do syndication. So we're talking large commercial complexes with debt ranging in the millions of dollars. I sleep well at night knowing that all of those uh, debt, all those loans that we have outstanding, there's a reason for every single one of them. And that reason is to increase wealth and to provide value. So none of those are hanging over my head like a sword about to fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say kind of uh, tagging onto that too. With with uh, real estate debt especially, it's tied to an asset that you own at the time. And so um, especially with down payments and stuff that you generally can always pay off the debt if you ever need to liquidate your asset. So as long as you're not over leveraging, um, I think that helps keep me comfortable a lot is seeing that whole... Uh, you see the assets column and you see the liabilities column and you know, okay, you know, if, if uh, you know, a bank decides to screw me over or something like that, I've got the asset that I can use to, to remove that debt um, if needed, as long as I haven't bought, you know, uh, horribly or something like that. But yeah, that definitely helps. I think with the debt is that it wasn't first consumer depreciating, you know, good, like a couch or something, uh, but instead was, was tied to an asset. Mm -hmm. And so um, are you, um, actually operating on fixed interest rates when you uh, take loans or something like this? Or how, how does this work for you? I mean, especially uh, in the long term. Um, so I'd um, say for me, I typically, I've so far primarily looked at, uh, oh, like adjustable rate mortgages. And that's primarily been that I'm, I'm looking for more value add and trying to get as much cash flow initially as I can. Um, and then looking to refinance everything into a fixed rate portfolio uh, down the line. So right now I'm kind of first focusing on getting uh, as much margin as I can in the cash flow. Uh, and the nice thing is there's only so much that the interest rate can raise per year. So uh, there's you know within the contract of the type of loan I get, uh, it always has that that limiter on it, and that I think helps me to be able to project. Okay, you know worst case scenario, this is what it's going to be in three years. And I have a pretty specific time that I want to go ahead and refinance everything into a portfolio where it will be fixed. Um, so I'd say, yeah, for, for long term, definitely trying to get into a fixed rate is important. But I think for the sake of getting a deal done, um, you know, the adjustable rate can sometimes really make the difference on, on the initial phase. And then uh, for myself, uh, I own a house hack, which is a long-term rental. And that one was just buying at the right time. So it was a fixed year FHA loan at the 2.375%. So that one's sitting pretty. Uh, nowhere to go. It's nice and low. We're going to have right now an easy street for a little bit. Uh, but for the commercial properties, a lot of over the last two years, you know, with the hyper competition, um, and trying to get things done. A lot of bridge loans will be going out. So the properties that we have have bridge loans on them with have whole you know, terms of a couple of years, maybe three to five years, at which point we're going to have to refinance out of them. So at the larger syndication side, we have those adjustable rates. And just like Drew said, it's all about trying to get the deal done. And if a property doesn't meet um, the guidelines that maybe Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac uh, set out and we can't get a fixed rate agency loan, then we got to be creative because people still need housing. They still need people to come in and renovate properties. There's a nice, safe, affordable places to live. 
and we still need to get deals done. Investors still need to put cash somewhere. So just because it gets a little bit harder and the way is a little bit rockier doesn't mean that we just sit back and say it's too difficult. We'll try again in a couple of years. Uh, it's all about being creative and finding ways that you can come together to get the thing done. You're both in your mid-20s. When and how did you start? And uh, yeah, I mean, especially how did you start uh, investing in real estate so so early? Uh, yeah, so I got started in the midst of COVID-19 when I was stuck at home and had absolutely nothing to do. <laughs> um, I had junior year of college and I realized I put some money in the stock market. And because of someone that wasn't me somewhere across the world, my portfolio was now worth half as much. So I started looking for ways to have more control over my own finances, which led me to finding real estate and I started wholesaling. So I launched and operated a wholesaling company for the duration of my senior year of college, realized I wanted to get into something that was a little bit more long term, more passive, had some more tax benefits over the long term and decided, well, I see people doing wholesaling and they typically go to flipping. And then people go to flipping to rentals and then rentals to bigger rentals and then bigger rentals to apartment complexes or storage units. So why don't I just skip all the middle stuff and just go straight to the big stuff? Mm -hmm. So I found someone, um, put an offer in a 96 unit building in St. Louis, which ended up kind of falling apart right after my graduation from college. And then in a year and a half since, I was invited to join a multifamily syndication company. And we took down a 172 unit complex this past July. And just about a week ago, we got our offer accepted another 120 unit. Um, and in the midst of that, on my 22nd birthday, after a couple about a year of analyzing properties, I close on a house hack because everyone that I talk to, just like you're asking us, asks if you can go back in time and do something different. Almost every investor I talk to is like, I wish I house hacked right away. Minimize your expenses, mm -hmm. maximize your cash flow and net worth. And that's what I tell you to do. So it really didn't take too much thinking in my part. Don't walk away from this thinking that I'm the smartest guy in the room because I'm definitely not. <laughs> um, it's just listening to other people saying, this is what I would have done and saying, okay, I'll do that. And yeah. I'm going to do that. And that's what I've done. And that's how I got to where I am after about two and a half years in real estate. I mean, this still sounds super, super easy. I mean, now you're you're talking about it in, in such a light way. Like, yeah, I, I did uh, this wholesale and then I, I switched over just directly to, to the big stuff. But I think at the at the beginning, it was probably super hard. Probably there are still times when it's super hard. So what would you say are the highs and lows of real estate investing, especially in the beginning? I would say some of the highs are when you realize that you can make way more money working for yourself on your own schedule. And you realize the power and the kind of facade of traditional income earning starts to lose its shimmer because you're realizing, oh, there's so many different ways that I can earn a living. And that was one of the first deals I did was the very first transaction I ever closed was a virtual wholesaling. It was 30 minutes of work. And I got a check for two grand. And it was like, how can I go back? How can I <laughs> not go back to just like making that in a month or something like that? Uh, so the highs are definitely understanding that how much, uh, not only you know, income can you earn, but also how much income you can keep through various tax benefits. And once you start learning, it just unravels. And it's like you're adding all this value to your mental toolbox, so all these tools you have. And you're just like, oh my gosh, I can do this. And you start looking around and now you don't see a hotel and go, oh, that's cool. Or you don't see a apartment complex and go, that's kind of neat. You look at that and say, I could own that. How many units is that? How many windows? <laughs> uh, how much income could that, what's the NOI? Um, some of the lows, I'm sure Drew will agree with me, is when you put an offer out, it doesn't get accepted. Or you are um, buying a property and you walk in and it needs way more work than you thought it would. Or essentially, basically, when your expectations fall in, in relation to reality and you think you're going to be able to make X much or do it so fast or do it in this certain way, um, and you realize that real life has different plans and it's going to take time and it takes consistent effort. And sometimes you're going to miss out. You might do a bad deal and recognizing that one bad deal doesn't mean the entire real estate industry isn't worth it. It just means now you have better experience on how to find good deals and maybe you can tweak something in your system to keep moving forward. I'd say definitely the, the highs for me were kind of like Donato was saying was once you realize that. Um, it's not just about trading time for money uh, or even like a specific deal for money, but it, it becomes a percentages game. And you realize, oh, wait, okay, if I get, if I can pull this 
percentage of profit. If I always know I have that for any deal I do, then it just depends on how big of a deal I take down. You know, if I keep my criteria the same and the margins the same, you know, I can do this for a, a two unit property or a 10 unit or a hundred unit. And you just suddenly see that massive margin grow. And, and I think that definitely uh, what Donato is saying is, you know, <laughs> you suddenly realize the beauty of, of, oh my gosh, I can never go back. I can never go back to say, okay, well, I'm worth 23 an hour. Okay. Now I'm worth 25 an hour. You know, man, this is awesome. It's no, that's, you know, it's such a small difference. Um, for me, for my background, I I initially interned with Brandon Turner uh, with Open Door Capital, which is a commercial syndication group for uh, mobile home parks. And then I, I went and worked for IGB Capital. So I have not my own uh, personal portfolio in large syndication deals. Uh, I have a personal portfolio of, uh, oh, I've done five deals, currently hold three, um, but they're just in the single family range. Um, but definitely have familiarity with working on those larger deals. And it is, it's crazy when you, when you see that, man, this, this deal took the same amount of time as a deal that was half this size that we did, you know, six months ago. And now we're all, you know, doubling profits of, of what's going on. So I'd say definitely the, the highs of real estate and investing in general is just that you're, you're playing off of margins and percentages. And that's just so much more fun than any typical job. <laughs> Lows wise, I'd say for me, um, I, I do a lot more of the work myself. Cause I'm not, you know, like with my personal portfolio, I'm not working on 160 units. So uh, I kind of can get caught up into doing the work myself rather than fitting that into my margins. Um, so I'd say definitely the lows will be things like, uh, you know, gutting for hours and hours on end. And you know, I had like, uh, I had two dead squirrels fall on my face while I was gutting ceilings one time. It was just, there's some really, you know, nasty, icky stuff that's not fun uh, about real estate. But for me, that kind of almost just makes it more fun. Like it's more of an adventure. It's less just boring desk job or something like that. There's more interaction and you know, even things like, you know, having a board fall and land on your foot or something like that. It's, it just, it feels like you're actually doing something with your life rather than just sitting all day long. So I, I still enjoy that part, even though it is uh, sometimes stressful or kind of achy. Am I informed correctly that you both kind of uh, started directly from college to real estate or have you been employed in other ways before? I grew up in a family that had uh, a very entrepreneurial mindset. So we read Rich Dad Poor Dad at age 13. We'd have uh, lunch meetings talking about stocks and what was going on. So it was uh, kind of a, a very non-typical growing up, I'd say. So I already knew I was going to go into some kind of, you know, uh, work for myself type thing. Um, but I definitely had no idea that it would be real estate. So I'd, I'd already been doing graphic design and uh, web design for a good while all throughout college. Um, but yeah, pretty much, I think it was during college, I had my first deal and it was a quadplex that uh, kind of just fell into my lap. Um, but yeah, no, pretty much started immediately um, right around that college age and then haven't stopped really since then. You should know that Drew is an absolute tank. You cannot be stopped. Uh, <laughs> and part of the thing that makes Drew so you know, so successful is that he's like, he said a little bit earlier, he has fun. The whole thing is just fun for him. And so it's like, oh, I can go do this. And, you know, being a business partner with Drew, that's one of the best things about it is that his fun is infectious. And so we're like, all right, we're going to we're gonna do some fun. And um, I don't know. Had to shout out Drew. Love the guy. <laughs> um, for me personally, I started in college. Um, didn't I wasn't fortunate enough to have a family who was always talking about stocks or entrepreneurship growing up. Uh, it was very much kind of like good grades, good school, good job, you're set. Uh, even my you know, grandfather, who was a third generation business owner, um, I tell him like, oh, I want to get into real estate and do entrepreneurship. And he's the first person to tell me, well, don't forget the day job, secure, <laughs> stable. And I'm like, you're the one guy that should be telling me to go out for it. Uh, but I think the main difference is this mindset of survival versus thriving. Uh, when you're so focused on just day to day, like I need to get this deal done, this uh, customer landed so I can generate enough money to take it home and pay my guys. Survival is way different from looking up and taking your head out of the sand and seeing what's coming on the pipeline. Can I get to a point where my stress goes down, my profits go up? So I'm not just trying to skate by, I'm trying to actually grow. And so that's the mindset that I've had to learn, which is why when I got to college and I started investing in the stock market, I saw that tank, COVID, I needed to get get away from just surviving, I need to start learning how to grow and how to thrive, which is what launched me into my first uh, coaching group with real estate, which launched me into wholesaling. And then each person I met got me one step closer to 
a house hack, which now does phenomenally, and the first syndication, and then eventually meeting Drew, and then eventually doing the project that we're working on with Bright Investor. You know, it's been a steady climb since my junior year of college, meeting the right people at the right time, and continuing and continually to choose to grow instead of just being satisfied with, well, I guess it's good enough. I mean, I might have dreams that are out there, but uh, I don't need to chase them. Like abandoning that mindset and saying, no, I can do these things. I want to do these things. I will do these things. And then consistently choosing that over other distractions. Yeah, you also kind of mentioned that uh, there's a lot of fun involved in, uh, especially you both working together. Then I, I wonder how does a like typical work day, work week, or in general, the work <laughs> look like for you? Are you just uh, uh, all day uh, yeah, driving with a car around, finding new properties, or how, how does it look like for you? So for me, it's a bit more on the real estate side. I, I acquire properties. I kind of focus a lot for maybe about a month or so on it while I get it stabilized because I, I primarily buy for the sake of holding long-term and just doing long-term leases. Um, so when I'm not doing that, I'm just working on Bright Investor uh, with that software, just helping with development. Um, but yeah, typical day, I, you know, every single morning, I, I check from my realtor all the new properties that have come up. I've, I told him like, okay, my criteria is everything. Just send me every single thing that comes on market. I just want to see it. That way I get a pulse of what's going on. So it's kind of like my uh, daily morning read is just going through and seeing what each property is going up for. Yeah, beyond that, then I meet probably about three times, three to four times uh, with different investors in my area for lunch throughout the week. Um, usually we'll have at least one or two calls a day, you know, talking with other investors as well. I, so I, I try to keep pretty involved and on the pulse. And then, yeah, I, I usually for about an hour a day or so, we'll read through forum boards and, and interact there too, because that's where a lot of my education comes from. Um, and then anytime I'm driving, I'm listening to audiobooks on on investing or uh, business leadership type stuff. Um, but no, I, I don't do a ton with, with the real estate. It's not a ton of a, every single day, you know, actually going and working on a project. I, once a project that comes up and meets my criteria, then I go ahead and buy it. And, um, typically for that, then I'll, I'll work, you know, like 12 hour days, just going in, gutting, renovating. Um, but, but outside of that, it's more just kind of continually looking every single day, what's coming down pipelines, what, what potentially will create uh, an opportunity. And I think that's the biggest thing is, um, you know, people will talk about sometimes that idea of like, you know, you got lucky or something like that. You found something. It's like, well, I didn't get lucky. I've literally viewed every single property that's come up on the market in the past two and a half years in my market. So it's like, well, of course, I'm going to see the opportunity come up. I mean, there's no way I wouldn't because every single day I'm checking it. And if it's at all remotely interesting, I immediately start running it through my calculators and figuring out, is this a deal I want to do? Um, I think that's really crucial. Even if you're not doing some kind of giant business with it, it's just knowing if you want to get lucky uh, keep doing the habitual work. And Drew brought up an awesome point that luck is just preparation, meeting an opportunity. And what he just said, two and a half years, looking at every property that comes on the pipeline, that's consistency. And with consistency, success is always going to come about. And so if he's looking at every property and he's finding the good ones and the bad ones, and when he takes that action, it looks like luck from the outside, but no one sees the years of work and preparation that he put into it. And I think that's can separate people or uh, when people are getting into real estate investing for the first time, they see all these people doing these amazing deals on their social media feeds. And it can be, you know, encouraging, but also a bit disheartening when they go out and they're not finding all these deals right off the bat that meet all these criteria. Mm -hmm. And the thing you have to remember is people are doing so many uh, hours of looking and analyzing and research behind that they're going to show you the cool stuff. And they want to, they want to kind of hold back the stuff that's not as fun or not as um, communicative of how great real estate is because by and large people want other people to get into real estate. And if you front load that with, here's how hard it is right off the bat, it can dissuade people. And so in order to get people into the industry to show how great it is and how people can achieve that financial freedom, right? We have to be showing off, the things that you know do well, the things that are big profit makers, the things that you know really are eye catch, eye catching. And talking about uh, getting people into real estate, so uh, your relation or current relation is, uh, as you both mentioned already, a Bright Investor. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, what is Bright Investor? What's behind that? Yeah, so Bright Investor was kind of born out of necessity. 
So Drew and I, as you can see, both invest in real estate. And there's always this problem that comes from the golden rule of real estate, which is location, location, location. Because where you buy is so important, down from the city to the zip code, to the neighborhood, and even to the street in some markets. And with the commercial syndication that I do, um, what I do is market research. So I want to answer the question, why are we buying in the state? Why are we buying in the city? Why am I buying in this area? Are every, is everything coalescing to make a strong investment? And so what that means is we have to spend hours across dozens of websites, cross-referencing and checking, creating lists of how the, how's the population growth? How is the job growth in this area? Are people moving in who are going to be good, qualified, well-paid residents? What's the crime look like in the area? Is it a high, higher crime or lower crime area? Is our rents going up or are rents decreasing or are they stagnant? Are properties increasing in value appreciation-wise? How are the school systems nearby? Or is, are those going to attract residents that have families who are going to stay for longer periods of time? Basically, all of these community and market-level metrics that affect your investment and overall your net worth and your cash flow, there's just so few resources that quickly and accurately pull all that information together and put it in one place. And not just in one place, but one place that you can see on a map so you can take action. You don't have to read all these different papers and all these different pamphlets to go ahead and understand it all. That's where Bright Investor came from. Finding this problem, spending too many hours having to do it ourselves and realizing that through our own independent means, there has to be a better way. And eventually, Drew and I coming together, meeting and realizing that we have the potential to create this awesome product, which is what we've been working on for the, over the past year. A big thing, especially because like, I'm not in the syndication side as much anymore. Um, so I'm not doing the market research in the heavy side where like you know you see these giant investors where they're pouring tons of money and time. But just on the individual lower side of doing, you know, single family properties in a market, there's so much data out there that takes so long to read through that when I was first getting started out, I didn't, you know, I did do research on markets, but eventually I just got overwhelmed and said, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to go ahead and invest in my backyard. I'm just going to buy, you know, where I kind of want to live and then I'll buy the next property around it. And it in no way was a strategic uh, decision. And looking back now, I'm like, well, I've bought, you know, I've done five deals all in this market that I hope does well. But if I instead knew where the opportunity zones were within my market, you know, you can have one of those properties within three or five years, double in value compared to another property, maybe appreciates 2.5% every year. And that's massively different, you know, different on what uh, your portfolio is going to perform like, especially, if, you know, if you're buying maybe 10 or 20 properties, and all of them are in opportunity zones that are going to double in value within five years. Um, you know, your your whole portfolio, your whole everything is going to look completely wildly different um, than if you're just kind of buying wherever. And and so that was kind of where I where I found the value was not through this intense market research, but was through just realizing, you know, man, all these little tiny decisions they really do make a big difference. If I can spot those opportunity zones and not have to spend hours upon hours of research every single time that a property comes across my plate, if I can just grab that address, plop it in and say, okay, visually what's happening around this property. Okay, cool. And then I can see, you know, the trends. Okay. Yep. The, that looks like an opportunity zone. The appreciation is moving that way. Um, that, that definitely I think provides a lot of value, but it's something that smaller investors are not going to spend eight hours, every single property analyzing what's happening on that street. Um, so yeah, trying to bring that down to about three minutes. And it's like this, Drew saying, this is real world impact. If I'm buying five properties in one zip code and the appreciation rate is 1% lower than somewhere else, that is going to equal tens of thousands of dollars lost in your net worth and your value over time, simply because you didn't know or you didn't have the right tools. And so everything we're looking at here is designed to help real estate investors achieve that you know, cash flow achieve that end result they're looking for, not by guessing, not by just relying on their friend who's lived in the area for 20 years and totally knows what's going on, but with true data. So, you know, without a doubt, this is what's happening here. If I buy here in this location for these reasons, I'm going to get X back. It is mm -hmm. allowing you to calculate the ROI so much more efficiently.
next from long-term rentals. That's from even fixing and flipping, seeing where the path of progress is, knowing that if I buy a flix and flip on the wrong side of town, that's not the place that a lot of new development's happening. So I might have a harder time selling it versus I'm going to buy this flip and it's right in the path. People are moving this direction, this side of the city. I can buy here and it's going to do well. All of these things, you need to know what's happening in your area. And as Drew said, from the small to all the way to the big, the question remains, where is the best? What should I do? What's going to serve my goals the most importantly? How would it work for investors or entrepreneurs in general? So how, how would they use it? There's kind of two use cases. There's the initial when you're just trying to figure out where in the world do I even want to start investing, you know, bef you know, city-wise. Um, you know, I've heard Chattanooga's great. I've heard Houston's great. But I don't know anything down there. Um, so, for instance, when I was working with uh, Brandon Turner uh, out on Maui, he had asked me, hey, I want to buy a property. I don't know where, but can you just look for a quadplex and and find one that's going to cash flow about this much and blah, blah, blah. And he just told me to go out and start looking through markets. And I I spent probably around 20 to 30 hours researching all these different areas. And it just, it took forever. And in the end, um, you know, we kind of narrowed it down to about five markets. And I just started calling realtors there and asking what are typical rents. And it just, it was such an inefficient way to do it. So there's that initial way where you can you know, look up some articles, um, figure out what seems to be booming in the news right now in terms of markets, and then take those. So like, you know, let's say Houston, for instance, put in Houston, and then it's going to have all the options on the side. You can look through appreciation, rent, crime, and it's going to present heat maps, plots, uh, different like uh, by zip code heat maps. So you can kind of tell from larger scale all the way down to street specific, uh, narrowing in, you know, where you want to focus. From there, then now kind of stage two would be finding a realtor in that area and telling them, hey, here's the zip codes I want to focus on in Houston. Um, find me properties that meet this criteria. And then when they send you those properties, like I said, I do every single day. If one interests you and you say, oh, I think that's a good price. Let me go ahead and grab that address. I'll just plop it straight into Bright Investor. And now I've got that pin on the map. And I can just start cycling through the different data types and visually see what's happening right around that mark, you know, that street. Like, okay, is the is the crime going up or down? How many crimes are there within the last six months on this street? Uh, what type of crimes? What's going on? You know, rent. What's the average rent around there for a three bedroom? Or um, kind of, it, it really helps me to quickly get a visualization, like an understanding where I can comprehend what's happening around this property. Um, because I already do the the property analysis itself, which like there's tools like Bigger Pockets calculators that within about three minutes you can have a good understanding of how the property will perform, but you don't know how the market that affects the property will perform. Um, so that's kind of what this solves. Exactly. I mean, you can have a house in California that's a million dollars, the exact same bed, same bath, same square footage in another state is going to be worth fifty grand. And the answer for why is one house worth nearly a million dollars more is because of where you bought it. And so when you have that property come across your table, throw it in Bright Investor, see what's going on. And you're no longer, you're no longer shooting in the dark when it comes to these properties that you're interested in buying. You know for a fact this is what the data supports. And that data turns into whatever your goal is. Um, mm -hmm. There's even the opportunity for people who are targeting specific types of rentals, like short terms or midterms. You need to be closer to certain types of businesses, like hospitals for travel nurses. If I'm throwing in this property, not only can I see things like crime and rent, I'm going to make sure that I'm the property I'm buying is near the places that who I'm targeting want to be around. Mm -hmm. You're getting the whole picture when it comes to what are all the factors that could help determine this rental or this property success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that even includes stuff like industry growth. So if you're looking for, you know, uh, like travel nurses, it's like, well, okay, is, you know, it, are hospitals a big industry in this city? And is that growing or is it decreasing? Or is it kind of stagnant? Um, you know, seeing that value as well, it just, it, it really helps to, I think, just quickly comprehend what's going on. Yeah, this sounds uh, definitely cool in general. As far as I know, you're quite starting with this project. So at which phase of development and uh, yeah, which kind of business phase are you with Bright Investor at the moment? Sure. So we've been working on it for a little over a year now, and we're just in pre-launch. So right now, fingers crossed, we hope to be launching in March 2023. 
So we're about three months out from being able to put this product out on the market and start getting some people to become bright investors and join our community. So just a few short months away and we'll be hitting the marketplace. Amazing. Then is there anything, any way people may eventually support you uh, on that way? I mean, one of the biggest ways is just kind of getting the word out. So we, you know, we have the website, uh, brightinvestor.com. If they go on there, there's some free resources they can sign up to get uh, prior to our launch. And that'll kind of notify them. We're trying to kind of get the word out, spread awareness about it. So, you know, sharing posts, viewing, uh, watching what we're doing, listening to the podcast, sharing them with friends. Yeah, we, we definitely, the biggest thing right now is just getting the awareness out there. So yeah, I'd say that that's one of the main things. And, And when you come to our website and you do sign up for those free resources, you join our list of people who are going to be the first to know about Bright Investor when we launch, when we add new things to the platform, and as we continue to grow. So you're going to be one of the first people to have the opportunity to leverage this platform. And if you want to hear more about it, throw your email out, we'll get in touch with you, like on our stuff, subscribe uh, to any you know podcast channels that are like yourself, Sam, for having us on and start talking about it. Ask questions. We want to engage with you. You can find us on social media too to ask questions. Um, I know I'm on Twitter at Don Callahan RE. Also on Instagram and Facebook at Donato underscore Callahan and Donato Callahan with my name being D-O-N-A-T-O. Uh, but we want to talk about the platform, it's something we're super passionate about. It's something we can't wait to launch and either on our uh, the social media channels or our website or posting about it and asking questions. We happy to engage with you guys and let you know as soon as it hits the market. I'm at Drew underscore McCluskey on Instagram and Drew McCluskey RE at Twitter. Yeah, either of those, just feel free to reach out and we can collaborate or just talk, anything. Yeah, cool. Then thank you for taking the time. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for taking part in this Never Employed Chat. Subscribe to my YouTube channel for more interviews with business owners and investors. Or simply listen to the audio version in your favorite podcast directory. Make sure to follow me on all your preferred social media platforms so that you never miss life-changing business tips. You find me on every platform with the account name samhartman.com. Start a business, become successful, and tell me about it. See you next time.